Go. What's up guys, Marvin and Kid here, long time no see, right? Two weeks. Um, I apologize for the delays with the reviews, uh, I was playing catch up uh, with the books. Um, so I, I was going to do um, last week's, the February 8th books that came out that week, but I decided, I decided, you know what, I'll do that maybe later or so. So I'm going to start with, with the books that came out last week. Uh, February 14th um, so let's kick it off and then I'll get then we'll get into the new stuff that came out this week so we'll kick it off first with Marvel and uh, which came out last week and there might be some spoilers but not too much okay so um, amazing spider-man um, six seven seventy nine point one um this was a really good book. This was really good. Uh, Yosh, Christopher Yosh and Dan Slott wrote this, and I hope everybody watched Deadpool, uh, my mentor, Gabby, Blue Goblin's review. Um, this was an interesting book because this was all about who is in lab number six, uh, that in the, uh, where Peter works, and we find out who's in there. And basically, I guess I can spoil who it is. I mean, if you haven't read it, I apologize. But uh, Michael Morbius, the living vampire, is in Lab 6. And Peter and another fellow uh, co-worker of his, Awatu Jackson, uh, find out about it. And they take on uh, Morbius. Morbius actually is trying to cure himself. He's, he's trying to get over the hunger of blood and plasma and all that. But... Uh, the hunger is still too strong. Um, but it was actually, this was fairly good. It was really good, still good. Uh, but it was the twist at the end who Michael Morbius was talking to. And I won't spoil that. Sorry, won't spoil that. Um, but it's another classic Spidey villain. I'll give you that. But yeah, this was good. Okay, um, Avenging Spider-Man number four. Uh... This one has um, Hawkeye, him and Hawkeye teaming up. However, it's being drawn by Greg Lamb. Okay. Um, see, now Marvel, see, you got Lamb touching my hero. And it's bad enough you had him touching the X-Men. Now you got him touching my hero. You know, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. It was good to see Spidey and Hawkeye team up. It was funny because they were bantering back and forth. We also got an interesting take on why Hawkeye in some way needs to be the best in his way. The way he sums it up is, is that Hawkeye says, Spidey's always saying, like, why do you always train? Why are you always training? He's saying because I'm, I'm on the Avengers. Basically, he kind of gives that notion of since I'm the only one on the Avengers that pretty much technically doesn't have powers, I also have to stay a, a, in at, on my A game in this. But they fought the Serpent Society in this, and it was pretty good. Alright. Avengers, number uh, 22. Um, Bendis and uh, uh, Guidis, I am hope I'm saying your name right, who does the artwork on this. The Avengers have been captured by the combine of Hammer, Hydra, and, and all those other organizations. So they're at the mercy of their captive. And it's pretty much, they're just trying to figure out their, the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. and, um, I mean not S.H.I.E.L.D., all the organization Hammers trying to, first of all, they're trying to get Tony Stark's uh, armor, trying to get it off of him and things like that. Uh, they're toying with Spider Woman. They're trying to get into um, Red Hulk. Everything. 
Um, and but the vision is still out there, and he needs Jarvis to call in the other for help. Um, and other than that, we also see the president talking about why is no, Osborne telling the truth about him not being trialed like a uh, like a regular you know regular uh, in court and everything like that. He was just thrown out of office without any due cause. And that's pretty much how this leads up to. But so far, right now, the Avengers are at the mercy of their captive. But we all know that's not going to last. Avengers 22. And don't let the cover fool you guys. There was no big fight between um, Cap and the, the Gorgon. I thought it would be. That would have been really cool. Okay. Daredevil number 9. Once again... You gotta praise Mark Wade, man. He is doing, he's done an excellent job with Daredevil, and this time Daredevil goes to Subternia. Uh, I hope I'm saying his name, saying it right. Um, you see, the Moloids have been have basically stole the grave of Matt's dad, but it wasn't just his; it was a lot of graves in this graveyard. So Matt has to go in. And look for basically he's dealing with the mole man in this, which was interesting. But also on the side note, he's still dealing with what happened between him and the black cat. Yeah, they slept together. Okay, um, and he's also holding on to a piece of the micro, the uh, Fantastic Four embryo that a lot of six terrorist organizations in the Marvel universe want. And uh, we also can see black cat get hired by one of those organizations to steal it. And, uh, basically, yeah, she does. But, uh, yeah, it's all about Matt down in Subterranea, basically dealing with the Mole Man and trying to get his the grave of his dad back. But it's, so, it's to be continued. Alright. Iron Man, Invincible Iron Man number 513. This was good. Um... The Mandarin is still making his move, and he made his move on his home country of China. And he's trying to, he, he's, he had uh, Zeke, Zeke, uh, Zane, uh, uh, is <laughs> Stain, Zeke Stain, Obadiah Stain's son, create new dread, dreadnoughts for him. And uh, Tony's there, still pretty much battered up, you know, his... His main repulsor circuit that keeps him alive has been pretty damaged. Don't let the cover fool you. It's no battle between him and, and Rhodey. But they're there just trying to deal with what's going on in China. And we get to see a new team, China's version of the Avengers, called the, uh, what are they called? The Revolution, I think they're called. Um, but it's all a plan for that the Mandarin is putting together. But I also wanted to show you how much the Mandarin has upgraded pretty much all of Tony's rogues gallery. So I'm going to show you this real quick for you. Okay. Um, as you can see, he's basically upgraded every one of the rogues gallery. As you can see, all right, let me point it out for you guys. All right, there's, there's Whirlwind. There's uh, the Melter, there's Crimson Dynamo, there's Blizzard, there's Vibranio, there's Fireband, Chemistro, Chemistro, Titanium Man, uh, Fire, Firepower, the Malder, Living Laser. He's upgraded almost every one of uh, Tony's Rogue's Gallery for this big battle that's coming between all of them. It's good stuff right there. And like I said before, Salvador Salvador La Roca's artwork suits Tony, as well as this is the best book that Fraction writes. Next up, uh, New Avengers, number 21. Um, this is still going on with the new Dark Avengers story arc. Uh, Diodata's artwork is beautiful, done very well. In this book, the, the Luke's team is dealing with Ragnarok. Remember Ragnarok, the clone of Thor from the Civil War? 
yeah, Osborn got a hold of him, and that's what they, that's who the New Avengers are dealing with. Um, do they beat him? Yeah, they do. I'm I'm not gonna lie. They had some good teamwork. Spider Man played a big role in this because at the time when Ragnarok attacked him, all of them were falling off of a skyscraper, and it's Spider Man saving everyone, and he's webbing everybody up, saving everybody. Wolverine went in first to, you know, because he pretty much can take it. Um, and it was funny when uh, Spider-Man threw uh, Iron Fist back at him, and then he he's like, fist him, Iron Fist him. And Iron Fist says, I hate when people say that. I thought that was really funny when he said that. Um, but it's still all a ploy for, for, um, for Norman Osborn to make them look like the bad guys, you know, they were set up through this whole battle. They were set up to make to make them look like the bad guys. And at the end of the book, it it kind of kind of falls in the favor of what Nos Osborn was trying to do. Um, let's just put it like that. But they were able to defeat Ragnarok um, with good good teamwork, I must say. Okay. Um, Ultimate uh, Comics X-Men number 7. Alright, Nick Spencer does a pretty good job on this book. Does a good job. The bottom line in this book is is that we thought some of the characters were dead. They're not. Alright, I'm going to spoil it. As you can see right here, Scarlet Witch is alive. Yeah, we thought she died. She was shot. She's alive. And she, everything that has happened in this book from... Uh, lot of uh, Nimrods coming and destroying people in Times Square and everything like that has been put on blame because of Quicksilver. But also we find out that someone else from Quicksilver's family is still alive and you should already know who I'm talking about. Yes, Magneto is alive. He's not dead. Um, but he's now like some Jewish messiah, like all about God and everything like that. He, I think he's gone kind of crazy, but... Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it was. It was just focused more on Wanda and the Maximoff family, just put it like that. All right. Um, Venom, uh, Venom uh, Circle 4, Part 3, 13.2. Uh, um, the Circle of 4 story arc has been st standard okay. Um, you know, it's, it, first of all, it's good to see Black Bolt, okay, it's good to see Black, Black Heart, excuse me, Black Heart here, you know, he plays the major villain here, and it's good to see characters that want, and have, that may have their own book, or may not have their own book anymore, because it got canceled, uh, and just seeing these two, I mean, this is supposed to pay homage to the new Fantastic Four, um, story, but, uh, it's okay, it's been good, but, we're we're seeing that Alexandretta, who who plays who's the new the new Ghost Rider, she has to make up for everything she's done. She's the one that kind of caused hell on Earth in Sin City. Kind of funny, uh, but it hasn't spread thanks to Johnny Blaze putting the talisman up to block it, and also the help from Doctor Strange and other mystic uh, mystic art characters. But yeah, it's it's, it's good, guys. It's just that. Um, it seems to be leading up. It's leading up better, but it it's it's this story is more to pay homage to the new Fantastic Four. And you remember Wolverine, Ghost Rider, Hulk, and Spider Man, uh, pretty much. Okay. Uh, Ed Brubaker, I've said it before and I'll say it again. This guy has must have been playing Metal Gear Solid when he thought about writing this because. Winter Soldier number two. I love the duo. The 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 duo between Bucky and Natasha. They work so well together, and Ed, Mr. Brewrecker knows he knows what he's doing. He knows how to write Bucky, and but the bottom line is, Bucky still has to deal with the fact that he they're searching for three men that Bucky trained when he was the Winter Soldier under control by the Soviets. Um, 
but in the meantime, <laughs> they're dealing with a gun-towing gorilla with a 50 caliber gun shooting at them. And pretty much, when you think about gorillas in the Marvel Universe, you're thinking about one person, the Red Ghost. Yeah, Red Ghost plays a big role in this, along with the former uh, right-hand woman to Latveria, known as uh, Lucius von uh, Baradus, who was once the right-hand person to uh, Victor von Doom, and she actually sends out one of those soldiers that Bucky trained to try to assassinate Doom. Did it happen? This is Doom we're talking about, people. You know, not even a missile launcher can stop this guy. And that's what the guy tries to shoot him with. Right on the Latvarian embassy, which was crazy. So they're trying to deal with that and try to figure out where all the other individuals that Bucky trained. But this has been really good. This is just a really good Black Ops espionage book that Brubaker does very well. Though I'm still, I'm, I, I, I don't like the fact that, yeah... Bucky went back to being, you know, Winter Soldier, and the fact that he's pretty much staying in the shadows, that everybody still thinks he's dead, things like that, but it's been really good so far, and it's only two issues. Okay, moving on, uh, Wolverine 301, that is a beautiful cover by one of my favorite artists, Oliver Capelli, as you can see, that is a very beautiful cover. Um... Wolverine is still in um, Japan, and he's dealing with the Hand and the Yakuza going to war with each other, um, as well as his daughter, um, Amiko, uh, his adopted daughter, it's not his real daughter, uh, involved in this. We also get to see the new Silver Samurai in this. The original died, and so his son took over the mantle, and his kind of a cool fight between him and Wolverine and Wolverine's like, you know, you can't just use that name and things like that. And then the guy and then um Ken he says to him, he's like, This is funny, the American telling me about how to about my culture and everything like that. And Wolverine, the funny thing, I'm Canadian. And then the guy says, That's even worse. And I'm like, oh my God, what is why do they always do that? But um also, he's dealing with Sabretooth and Mystique that are in this book. They're, they're on the side with the hand. And as, a beautiful, as always, when it comes to a fight between Sabretooth and, and, Wol and, and Wolverine, they don't pull any punches. And boy, they don't pull any punches. This Wolverine goes to work on Sabretooth. Like, I'm talking about gut slashing in the chest, in the throat, and everything. And he even says, that, you know, that's the difference between you and me, Creed. And he says, what's that? And he says, and then he's just slashing away at Creed. Boom. And then one, one, uh, right to the throat. And he's like, I, I have something to fight. I'm worth, I have something worth fighting for. Versus his, 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 his adopted daughter. Um, this has been really good. Aaron's, Jason Aaron's, this is his last, uh, story arc for Wolverine. I'm going to miss him. Is Aaron's really knew how to do Wolverine right. And the, the all-star artwork in this is really good. There are different artists for different chapters in this book. Uh, but yeah, Wolverine 301, very good. If you haven't, pick it up. Okay. Um, uh, X-Factor 3232, uh, Peter David. Uh, so Madrix, Multiple Man, is still in that alternate world, and we're deal he's dealing with uh, who we thought was Doctor Strange, but actually was Dormammu, with the Eye of Agamotto and the, the cult cloth of levitation and everything. Um, and he's dealing with Dormammu, with a little help from Doctor Strange himself, I, I guess in an astral form, but he looks like what he, how Doctor Strange looked like when he was in the 70s with that all cloth blue, the blue look he had. Um, but does he get back to his own world? Like I said, there are some spoils here, people. Yes, he does. And um, he is welcomed in a very good welcome, if you know what I mean, <laughs> by Layla Miller. Very good stuff. Um, but yeah, Peter David still got it. It was just, uh, 
it's, it's good. I just can't wait to see how multiple man's gonna act when he sees Polaris and Havoc back with X Factor. That's that's my major point. Okay, so that's all the Marvel that I had for last week. Uh, let's move on to IDW. And, of course, only one. And that's Transformers More Than Meets the Eye, number two. Uh, James Robinson. So, the team... It didn't go so well for Rodimus and the group on the search to find the Knights of Cybertron. Uh, there was a malfunction and they crashed and a, a malfunction when they were about to warp jump and uh, they all crash land on this planet so they pretty much this is all them trying to find 40 of the crew members that crashed and we get to see a lot of things that start happening it's like you know Rodimus is all like you know should I He's talking to Ultra Magnus, who's his like second in command. He's like, should I tell them that you know we were lost, uh, we might not find them, everything like that, or should I lie to him? And Ultra Magnus is like, tell them the truth, you know, don't hide it, tell them the truth. And that's pretty much what this book is all all about, you know, just trying to find their lost members, everything like that, and coming to the conclusion that they're lost. And that's that's pretty much what it was, but it's still good. James Robinson does a really good job on the book, and uh, yeah, Transformers more than more than meets the eye, number two. Okay, and we move on to the DC that I had for last week. All right, guys, and um, Batman number six. Wow, um, Greg Capullo's artwork is good. Scott Schneider in this one. Oh my God, this guy, you talk about twist and turns and putting the screws to Bruce, um, making this even trippier than it is, talking about punishing Bruce in this book, hell yeah, man, is they, they punish Bruce a lot in this, but, and you think, you know, Bruce is going to overcome it just so fast, he doesn't, um, Talon just really plays mind games when the 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 the, the court of owls just plays really mind games with Bruce, and we get to see kind of who they really are. It's like a group of them. And does Bruce survive his ordeal? This is Batman, people. Okay, but this was a brain. Just my God, it was crazy. But uh, very good indeed. And, uh, you know, you got to give Bruce a lot of credit for overcoming what he did in this book. Very good. Very good stuff. Scott Schneider, you're doing a very good job on this, sir. Very good. Keep it up. Okay. Birds of Prey, number six. Uh, mind Control Mayhem. Okay, so the, the birds... Have found out they need to get to they they have to find a way to get to the person responsible for for mind wiping everybody putting bombs in people's heads things like that and it's a guy called Choke okay, yeah Choke like I said um, not a lot of Poison Ivy not a lot of um, Batgirl like my mentor said but there there it was good you know they they found out they need to use a guy that that could help them and they need to orchestrate a plan to get the the main adversary out in the open so they can see him like bring out you know like setting a trap setting a trap for him you know you try to catch a mouse what do you do set a trap right so that's what the birds do to try to get him out and uh, does it go according to plan mm, you know <laughs> but it was still good all right, this book, wow, this one was very sad in a way because, wow, Tony Bedard is putting Jaime through a lot of stuff in this. Blue Beetle, number six. When a friend becomes a foe, yeah. Last time we, in the last issue of Blue Beetle, the Scarab, to protect his, the Scarab's identity, 
it it stabbed it killed nearly killed Jaime's best friend Paco and uh, Jaime was like you better save him bug suit save him so what did the bug suit do is actually like put a I guess like a one of his probes or so into his friend Paco and this is what Paco becomes an armor plated just like the, the scarab so it's a battle between best friends and not only that they get their friend Brenda involved in it as well and Jaime's family his mom and his sister um, it becomes so bad at the end of the book Jaime runs away he runs away from his home and they they head he even tells the bugs who just, just let's just leave you know because he's causing so much trouble and damage to his family and his friends you know so he wants to get away from them um in some way he even says it you know i wish i never even found you you know and it, it's, it's very sad you know it's very hard to see that the next issue we i guess we find Jaime in the big apple but um yeah tony bedard does a good job but it's just very hard, like, it's very sad, and it's like, man, like, geez, they're putting Jaime through the ringer in this, you know, but Blue Beetle number six. Green Lantern Corps number six. All right, so basically this is all about um, the core dealing with the Keepers. Peter Tomasi does a good job on this book pretty just a all-around standard battle between the core and the keepers uh, John Stewart does something in this to a fellow lantern that was a little bit like whoa you know I can't believe you just did that John and they seem to be doing that with John a lot they seem to be putting the the you know the forefront on him I mean I mean let, let me just put it like this one of the lanterns that were captured by the keepers was going to talk was going to give up everything. And John literally just snaps this guy's neck. Just <clears throat> snapped his neck. I mean, we saw during the War of Lanterns, what did John do? He killed Mog Mogo. He, he, he killed him. So I was like, man, DC, are y'all trying to, why are y'all doing this to John Stewart now? But um, the ending was really cool to see what they did to the Keepers, how they were able to defeat them. Um, but it was also cool what they thought of. See, the, the, the core realized that the rings don't do anything to keepers. The keepers are pure willpower as it is. So their rings just don't really do anything. So what do they use? They use human weapons, guns and everything like that to do damage. But uh, it's what they really do as their final weapon to defeat them. And once again, like I said, there's spoilers here, guys. They, they drop one of the... Uh, Sinestro Corps members on them who is just full of fear and they the keepers get all scared like okay mercy we're, 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 we quit we quit and uh, it was kind of funny to see what uh, what um, John and um, and Guy tell him to do you know start burying all the bodies that you kill all the people you kill um, but yeah it was interesting very good okay Nightwing number six, um, Kyle Higgins. So at first, Nightwing is in Houston, in Texas. Uh, that's where Haley Circus was at the time, and we get to see a, in, a, a, I guess, a villain in this from Texas known as Shock. But he 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 looks like the Shocker, but he's not. He his suit looks more like how. Remember those battle suits and aliens that uh, Wrigley got into. In the first Alien movie, that's how it looks like. But he calls himself Shock, but he spells it S H O X. <laughs> so um, I don't get, I don't get it. But yeah, he's fighting there because he knows that the person that hired this guy knows some information about Psycho, the guy who's he's been trying to find out and who killed Mr. Haley and things like that. Um, we find out who Shock, um, it, I mean Psycho is. And somebody also is involved in it. Um, it gets really bad when the circus, Haley Circus, comes back to Gotham to pay homage to the Flying Graysons. Um, 
and that's where Dick fights Psycho, Psycho once again, and does he try to just, he just does something to Dick, and that circus just like, wow, you know, but other than that, it's, it's, it's building up very well, I, I you know, he found, Dick finally figured out who Psycho really is, they revealed who he is, and somebody from Dick's past. Okay, Supergirl number six. Uh, Michael Green does a very good job. Um, this picks up right where five left off. Kara was fighting this woman known as Rain, who is considered a world killer. And uh, she's stuck on Argo. Argo City, which is still floating, but it's about to crash into a star, and the star is moving farther and farther away from a yellow sun, so her powers are weaning, and uh, Rain lands in, lands in New York to basically take it over, um, and we get to see more of the you old know, Kara finally realizing, okay, my city is gone now, it's over, I'm done, this city is gone, I have to make a new home on Earth. But I have to save it first. And so she gets a little help from her parents, the spirit of her parents, to break free. But uh yeah, it was this is it was sad to see that. Like she she said goodbye to her parents in Argo City and flies back to Earth. But it was real sad to see that. To me it was sad. You know, I do get a little emotional, but yeah, it was sad to see and a fight is about to deter in in New York between Supergirl and Rain. And Rain is no joke. I gotta give her credit. She is no joke. This girl is probably just as strong as Supergirl. She's been watching Supergirl since she arrived on Earth. She knew about her cousin Clark, but she was more interested in Supergirl. But uh can't wait to issue seven to see that fight go into more detail. And last but not least, the last book for last week, Wonder Woman number six, uh, Brian Azzarello. Okay, so basically Wonder Woman is, she basically in this book, she's, she's trying to trick Hades and Poseidon to, and to get Hera's attention. Uh, since Zeus is somewhere around, I don't know where he's at. And, um, it's all about, you know, she just trying to tr trick Hera into getting a face-to-face one-on-one with, with her. Um, and that's pretty much all it is. Um, yeah, you can see, uh, Wonder Woman fighting Cerberus here, but there is no, really no big fight between her and Cerberus, just to cover. Um, and she's still trying to help out Zola, the woman that she's protecting. And she's still dealing with the fact that, you know, she... You know, her mother lied to her and the fact that, you know, she's the daughter of Zeus. You know, so she's a demigod. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. Uh, yeah. Not that good. Not bad. Not not all that good either. Just, it's there. Hopefully, one of them will still pick up. So, yeah. Okay. So, guys, that was the books that I had for last week for this episode. Um... I apologize for the lateness, you know, sometimes you, you got to play catch up, you know, do got a life outside, but other than that, thanks for listening, I'll stay tuned for the for this week's books, and see what I got, but other than that, thanks for listening, you guys take care.